Wow. That hydrogen chloride can in experiment is wonderful, isn't it? So just as after the thermite reaction at the beginning of the course, I wanted to give you at least some scientific background, even though maybe we're not prepared to deal with it in full. So too here for the hydrogen chloride cannon, I'd like to provide a little bit of the underlying thermodynamics before we move on to really discuss quantized energy levels in detail. So a, a pretty common thermodynamics question is, if I mix some stuff, what will happen? And in this case, the question was, if I mix chlorine gas with hydrogen gas, will I spontaneously, so that's, that's a word that actually has some meaning in thermodynamics, get hydrogen chloride? And that's what we did in the demonstration. We made hydrogen chloride from hydrogen and chlorine. And so one way to evaluate that, again using thermochemical concepts, would be to ask a question about bonding. So we can determine the energies of bonds in molecules by tearing them apart, looking at how much energy it takes to tear them apart. It turns out that for molecular chlorine, the strength of the chlorine-chlorine bond is 242 kilojoules per mole. And for molecular hydrogen, it's a stronger bond, 436 kilojoules per mole. The hydrogen chloride bond is also quite strong, 431 kilojoules per mole. So if I do the math here, I need to break two bonds. I need to break a chlorine-chlorine and a hydrogen-hydrogen. So that's 436 plus 242 kilojoules per mole. On the other hand, I will make two new bonds between hydrogen and chlorine that will release energy as I make the bonds, and it'll be 431 kilojoules per mole multiplied times two because I'm making two molecules. So do this simple arithmetic and you'll discover that we release, this is again an exothermic reaction, 184 kilojoules per mole of enthalpy. So that is downhill exothermic. If I were to plot this in a fairly typical way that chemists do, so I've got some reaction coordinate moving from left to right on a horizontal axis, and I have an energy or an enthalpy or a free energy, and part of the point of this course will be to start distinguishing more carefully between what those terms mean. For now, I'll label this enthalpy. I know that I go downhill from my reactants here, downhill 184 kilojoules per mole to my products, hydrogen chloride. However, there may be a barrier associated with that. So I had a tube with hydrogen and chlorine in it, and it was perfectly happy sitting there in the apparatus. And the issue is that even though it's net downhill to get from chlorine and hydrogen to hydrogen chloride, well, there's still a hill in between. So the elevation is such that spontaneity is expected, but you have to go up before you can go down. And in fact, one way we might go up would be to break a chlorine-chlorine bond first. And that, as we discussed, has a 242 kilojoule per mole input of enthalpy required. So you need to give it that much energy to get up to the top of the hill, at which point you will skitter downward fast to get 426 kilojoules per mole down to products. That's the equivalent of drawing some sort of a curve along the reaction coordinate, and that's the hill I was alluding to. And the energy out is enough to keep the reaction going. So if you like, we have to kickstart it. Actually, if you remember the thermite reaction, we had to start that one too. We had a sparkler that provided enough local heat to get the reaction going. But once it was going, it was off to the races. So net result, what we got from the initial thermochemical calculation, but we do need to get over a barrier. So barriers are actually the subject of yet another uh, course in physical chemistry. We might call it kinetics or dynamics. We won't have much to say about that in this course, which is about equilibrium thermodynamics, but I do want to give you a feel for what happened with the hydrogen chloride cannon. And in fact, uh, we're going to pause here, and you'll have a chance to uh, assess your understanding of that, because if you remember, we shown three different lasers into the mixture of the gases. And the red laser didn't do anything, and the green laser didn't do anything. But the blue laser provided enough energy. And remember that frequency of light, the, the wavelength of light is related to the frequency, times Planck's constant will give you an energy. And so the question is, what 
wavelength is required in order to get at least 242 kilojoules per mole worth of energy, which is what launches the reaction to its initial start, after which it all goes downhill. All right, so you've correctly ascertained, presumably, that it's blue light that has enough energy, more than 242 kilojoules. But now what? The reaction's started. So we've come in here with our little blue photon, our little uh, packet of energy, H nu, and it hit the chlorine, the chlorine gas absorbed it, it blew the atoms apart. And the net result, after it reacts with a hydrogen molecule, is to release 184 kilojoules per mole. When the reaction is complete, there will be 184 kilojoules per mole of thermal energy lying around that can be used to increase the temperature. So the temperature will go up. If we assume that we have an ideal diatomic gas, and we will very shortly be addressing uh, what that means to be an ideal gas and what properties diatomic ideal gases have, then we can compute the temperature increase based on knowledge of the energy change and a heat capacity. I mentioned heat capacity in the context of thermite. This is another heat capacity. It's a slightly different one. It's a constant volume heat capacity. That's why there's a V here as opposed to a P, what we saw in thermite, that was constant pressure. But in any case, I rearrange this. I'll get that the temperature change is the internal energy change divided by CV. We know what the energy change is, 184 kilojoules per mole. It turns out that the heat capacity of a diatomic ideal gas is 7 halves times the universal gas constant. That's a constant we'll see in just a few videos, and we'll uh, put, put a number with it and explain where it comes from. But if I do the arithmetic associated here, I will discover that the temperature goes up 6,323 degrees Kelvin. That temperature rise for a gas, you can relate the temperature of a gas in a fixed volume to a pressure. So Amonton's law tells us that at constant volume, there is a constant ratio between pressure and temperature. And as a result, if I look at the temperature variation versus the pressure variation and arrange room temperature 300 Kelvin, and I've now gone up to 6,323 Kelvin, then that will increase the pressure to 21 atmospheres from one atmosphere, normal ambient pressure. And that's why that cork shot out of the test tube, because we spontaneously increased the pressure to 21 atmospheres. All right, well, you've actually sort of seen two houses now. I did the house of the thermite reaction. I've done a somewhat different house, maybe it's a ranch house, of the hydrogen chloride cannon. It's time actually to really buckle down and start exploring in more nitty-gritty detail some of the uh, features that give rise to our being able ultimately to do these calculations. And so next, we're going to start at the most fundamental level and we're going to talk about atomic energy levels. Prior to the lecture on that topic though, let's take a look at a demonstration which will let us employ our own vision to appreciate the details of atomic energy levels. In the following demonstration, I want to illustrate the quantization of the electronic energy levels of the hydrogen atom. Here, we have a gas discharge tube filled with hydrogen gas at very low pressure. When we apply a high voltage to the gas, we cause current to flow by ionizing electrons from the atoms. In the process, many atoms of hydrogen are generated in excited electronic states, and we can observe light that is emitted by those atoms as they transition from one state to another that is lower in energy. Each of those transitions is quantized. That is, there's exactly one wavelength of light corresponding to the energy of a given de excitation. And the various wavelengths are reasonably well separated from one another in the visible part of the spectrum. That is, in the portion that we perceive with our vision. With the lamp on, it has a net color that appears roughly reddish-violet to us, but that's because we're perceiving all the various colors simultaneously as they impact our retinas. Instead, if we pass the light into a spectrometer that's capable of recording the intensity of different wavelengths, we can see 
absorptions at various characteristic values, while the rest of the spectrum is mostly baseline. Those peaks are centered at the characteristic emission lines with a little bit of broadening arising from various physical effects that we won't worry about here. We'll compute one or two of these lines wavelengths later on using what is known about hydrogen from quantum mechanics. For purposes of this demonstration though, what's important is to notice that there is not a continuum in energy distribution. Only certain levels are permitted so only certain transitions are observed. This is an amazing phenomenon in many ways. Imagine if I told you that you could throw a rock only at certain speeds and that no speed in between be possible. You would know from experience that that cannot be true. Any speed, and hence any kinetic energy, can be accessed. But at the microscopic level, the macroscopic rules of physics cease to be true, and indeed, only certain quantized energies are permitted for the electronic energy levels of atoms and molecules. This quantization can be a powerful tool. Did you know that the element helium was first discovered on the Sun and not on Earth? The French astronomer Janssen observed a strong spectral emission at 587.49 nanometers during a solar eclipse and since that emission did not correspond to any then known terrestrial gas, he assigned it to some unknown element in the sun's chromosphere. Only later was the gas isolated from deposits on Earth and shown to be the same by comparison of the spectral signatures. Indeed, I have a helium discharge tube here. When I turn it on, do you see how its color is quite different from the hydrogen tube? And if we measure the wavelength with the spectrometer, sure enough, we obtain a peak right here, centered at 587.49 nanometers. Next time you see a helium balloon, you'll have much more to think about with respect to the elemental properties of the gas.